They Called Her Molly Pitcher by Anne Rockwell. The genre is narrative nonfiction. Remember that narrative nonfiction tells about real people, things, events, and places. As you read, look for factual information that tells a story, illustrations that help to convey the ideas from the text, and the events in time order or chronological order. In 1777, a barber named William Hayes closed up shop and joined George Washington's Continental Army in the revolution against England. He went to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where a Prussian general named Baron von Steuben was training the Patriot troops in the formal rules of battle that armies used in those days. Like many women of the time, Hayes' wife Mary, nicknamed Molly, went with him. Some people think that she is the legendary heroine, Molly Pitcher. General George Washington was commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. He and other officers, plus a bedraggled army of about 12,000 men and boys, were camped at Valley Forge just before Christmas of 1777. Snow lay deep on the ground, and Washington's troops had run out of everything they needed to keep on fighting. Washington begged the Second Continental Congress for food and supplies, but none came. It was so cold that the soldiers had to stand on their hats in the snow to keep their feet from freezing. Their shoes had holes in them from tramping over miles of rough and stony ground. They had no blankets or warm clothes. They didn't have enough to eat. Their camp was a filthy mess. Many of them were very sick. Every day, more and more soldiers deserted. Others died. Molly and other women who'd followed husbands, sons, fathers, and brothers to Valley Forge did whatever they could to help. They cooked and cleaned, washed and mended clothes, and nursed the sick. But no matter what they did, more soldiers died each day. Things began to look up when the Second Continental Congress finally sent supplies. General Washington began planning to go to battle again. At the end of June, a scout brought news. A large number of British soldiers, led by Sir Henry Clinton, were gathered at Monmouth Courthouse near the New Jersey shore. The fight everyone had been preparing for was coming very soon. Washington ordered General Charles Lee and to lead an advance guard of 5,000 soldiers to attack the British. He'd send in a rear guard of more men soon after the fighting was underway. William Hayes was among Lee's advance guard marching to battle. As she always had, Molly followed. Winter at Valley Forge had been cold, but June of 1778 in New Jersey was hotter than anyone could remember. It was just after sunrise when American soldiers fired on the British near Monmouth Courthouse. Molly could see that the day was going to be a scorcher. Heat and humidity were already shimmering up from the ground. She decided what her job would be that day. She spotted a green and mossy place where a spring gushed up. She ran and filled her pitcher with cold water. She raced back to the battlefield, dodging cannon and musket fire, carrying her pitcher full of water for any American soldier who needed a drink. The Americans knew all about such hot and humid summer days. They knew they had to keep cool any way they could. They ignored what Baron von Steuben had taught them, about looking neat and military at all times. They stripped off coats, belts, wigs, hats, boots, shoes, and stockings, and tossed them onto the grass. Smoke, noise, and the smell of gunpowder filled the air. Molly paid no attention. All morning she ran back and forth from battlefield to spring, spring to battlefield, bringing water to men who'd collapsed in the heat. Over and over she heard the urgent cry of, Molly! Pitcher! Still more British soldiers under orders from Lord Cornwallis marched toward Monmouth Courthouse. The men formed a line of scarlet-like winding river of blood. They were a magnificent and terrifying sight, but their fine uniforms weren't what they should have been wearing in the sun that blazed down on them. Each man wore a tall black fur hat, scarlet coat of thick warm wool, a wide and shining black belt that had a sharp sword, a white waistcoat and matching woolen pants with knee-high, brightly polished black boots. Each marched with his eyes straight ahead, a musket on his shoulder, a knapsack full of heavy lead balls of ammunition, a knapsack, or sorry, on his back, they moved to the stirring music of war. Drums were beating, fifes were playing, trumpets were sounding. The soldiers started dropping as the sun rose higher. These Englishmen had never felt such heat in their home across the sea. It was almost a hundred degrees in New Jersey that day. Men grew faint and dizzy and fell to the ground. But their companions went on marching. They never stopped or broke step, even when one man or more collapsed. Fifty-six British soldiers died of heat stroke that day. That didn't stop them, though. 
All morning, more and more scarlet coats marched onto the field. Many American soldiers panicked at the sight of so many. General Lee couldn't maintain order. His soldiers forgot all about fighting in the disciplined ways Baron von Steuben had taught them. Instead, they ran in terror this way and that, hiding in ditches up in apple trees, beneath hedges. General Lee was sure that there'd be a massacre of his troops before morning turned to noon. He gave the orders to retreat. Molly saw that some of the men, including William, disobeyed the order and kept on fighting. The sun was growing hotter. As long as any members of the Continental Army needed water to drink, Molly Hayes wasn't going anywhere. On one of her trips to the spring, she stumbled over the body of an American soldier. She assumed he was dead until she heard him moan. The British were advancing quickly, guns aimed straight for their foes. Molly knew that she could run to safety, but the wounded man couldn't walk, let alone run. He lay directly in the line of fire and would surely be killed if he stayed there. He was a good-sized fellow, but Molly wasted no time wondering how she'd do what she had to. She picked, up, she picked the man up, slung him over her shoulder, and ran to a clump of bushes away from the gunfire. She laid him down there on the grass in the shade. She ran back toward the spring, past the cannon William was firing, just in time to see a ball from a British musket hit him. William fell to the ground. She examined her husband's wound and saw that he wouldn't die from it, but he couldn't fire his cannon. Someone had to. Molly grabbed the long ramrod and plunged it into the barrel of the cannon and fired it off. She kept on firing. A ball fired low from a British musket came whizzing straight toward Molly. She quickly spread her legs wide. The musket ball passed between them. It never touched her, but her skirt and petticoat were ripped and became a good deal shorter than they had been. She muttered that it could have been worse and went back to, firing, to work firing the cannon. Soon General Washington galloped onto the field, riding Nelson, his fine horse, who never shot at the noise of guns or cannons, no matter how close they were. Washington carried the flag of the commander-in-chief, thirteen stars in a circle on a field of blue silk. The flag fluttered and flew above the smoke of the battle. It wasn't as bright as the scarlet coats of the British soldiers wore, but to everyone who'd stayed on to fight, it was a cheering and glorious sight. For the rest of that hot and steamy day, the Continental Army fought the way Baron von Steuben had taught it to. George Washington saw to that. As he galloped over the battlefield, shouting orders and spurring his men on, he was amazed to catch a glimpse of a woman. She was blurred by the smoke that surrounded her. Her face was smudged with gunpowder and sweat. But George Washington saw her take a deep breath and then run and shove the long ramrod into the big gun with as much force as possible. The cannon boomed. The explosion shook the ground. But the woman paid no attention. She just got ready to fire the cannon again. When the sun set, the fighting stopped. Neither side could go on in darkness. Exhausted British and American soldiers put down their guns and tended to their dead and wounded. Late that night, they sat down to eat and rest to prepare themselves for another day of fighting. That same night, General Washington asked some of his officers about the woman he'd seen firing a cannon. He listened to what they said about how she carried water through the gunfire to the soldiers all that morning. Washington ordered that the woman be brought before him. He told her that she'd been as brave in battle as any man he'd ever heard of. He decided that she'd earned the rank of sergeant in the Continental Army. As she listened to what the tall, strong general said, Molly Hayes had never felt so proud in her life. No man who heard General Washington speak to her that night doubted that Molly had earned her rank. As news spread through the troops, no soldier sneered at the thought of a woman being a sergeant in his army, even though no one present had ever heard of such a thing. That night, Sergeant Molly Hayes lay down in the grass at the edge of the field beside William and the rest of the soldiers of the Continental Army. Long after the stars filled the sky, General George Washington spread his cape over the grass, tied Nelson to a tree, and lay down with his weary soldiers. As he lay gazing up at the stars, planning his strategy for the next day's battle, fires danced on the hill across the field where the British were camped. The voices of many men carried through the night. Sentries marched back and forth, keeping their endless watch. It was very late before everything was quiet except for the chorus of frogs singing in the nearby swamp. Molly and the other soldiers rose before the sun. They'd had some sleep and were ready to fight again. Many believed that they could win, but they didn't fight the British that day. No scarlet-coated soldiers marched onto the field. They'd gone away. Sir Henry Clinton and Lord Cornwallis had ordered a retreat, 
They didn't want their men to fight that wily old fox again this morning. They were afraid that they'd lose. Washington's Continental Army didn't fight like farmers, as the British leaders had been sure that they would. They fought like soldiers, and one of those soldiers was a woman.